we experience day and night. The stationary Earth, unlike the pole star, does not revolve on its own axis, though it is slightly tilted toward the pole star. During summer in the northern hemisphere, the North Pole experiences six months of daylight. Conversely, during summer in the southern hemisphere, the South Pole experiences six months of daylight. These six-month periods correspond to a day and night for the demigods living in the heavenly planetary system. Vedic cosmology accounts for this phenomena by the vertical motion of the sun, technically called Uttarayana and Dakshinayana. The sun moves upward on an incline for half a year and then downward for the next half. This motion produces two effects on Earth, namely the changing of the seasons and the varying durations of day and night. Ordinary vision sees the sun to be a mere globe of fire. However, celestial vision reveals a personality residing over the sun. His name is Vivisvan, and he rides on a golden chariot pulled by seven divine horses at a speed of 16,000 miles per second. The chariot has one wheel which moves on celestial Manasotara mountain. The horizontal shaft is linked to the axial hub of the universe, Mount Meru, and the diagonal shaft is linked to the pole star. With each circular path, the wheel gradually moves laterally inward for six months and then outward for six months. Similar to the chariot's vertical motion, this lateral action fine-tunes seasonal changes on Earth. When the orbital motion of the Sun is viewed from above, its illumination is seen to extend out to half of the greater Earth plane. During its orbit, the Sun passes over the four cities situated in the four cardinal directions. The city over which the Sun is passing experiences moon, and the city in the opposite direction experiences midnight. The two other cities experience sunrise and sunset. The zodiac is a conceptual celestial plate encompassing the entire sky. Like the face of a clock, the zodiac is divided into 12 divisions of 30 degrees each, called signs of the zodiac, or rashis each named according to the constellation of stars residing within them these signs serve as a set of reference markers for measuring the movements of the moon sun and the planets the zodiac completes one clockwise revolution of 360 degrees in every 24 hour period the moon travels through the zodiac but due to its slower angular velocity it completes only about 347 degrees in 24 hours, falling behind by about 13 degrees. The day after the new moon day, we see one moon phase. The next day, the moon again completes 347 degrees, and we see the moon in its second phase. In this way, the moon appears to travel in the opposite direction through the zodiac. This is also called retrograde motion. Thus, the phases of the moon increase each day for 15 days until the full moon. Then the moon's phases decrease gradually by one phase each day until the dark moon night. The Srimad Bhagavatam describes the vertical positions of the planetary orbits. First above the earth plane is the sun at a height of 0.8 million miles. Next higher comes the moon at 1.6 million miles, followed by the nakshatras, 28 stars, at twice the height, then Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Saptarishi constellation, and then finally the pole star at a height of 30.4 million miles. Although the sun is 0.8 million miles above the earth plane, its horizontal distance from the earth is much greater. 
Although varying with the seasons, the mean Earth-Sun distance works out to be approximately 100 million miles. 80,000 miles below the Sun is a dark or invisible planet named Rahu. When this planet comes between Earth and the Sun on the new moon day, or Amavasya, while the moon is in the same conjunction or straight line, a solar eclipse takes place. The eclipse is full for those on Earth who are situated in line with the conjunction while others may see it partially. Similarly, when Rahu comes between the Earth and the moon on the full moon day, or Purnima, while the sun is in the same conjunction, a lunar eclipse takes place. This is seen by anyone on Earth who can see the moon. The eclipse is either full or partial depending on the movement of Rahu. At least 5,000 years ago, the Vedas were able to predict eclipses precisely. This science is still used today with the same extraordinary accuracy. Science is defined as a systematized knowledge of things around us. So if we prove that Vedic cosmology is systematized knowledge, that would uh, prove in other words scientific nature of uh, Vedic cosmology. Modern uh, cosmic science is only a few centuries old, whereas our Vedic cosmology is uh, several thousands of years old. So the modern sci science ca certainly cannot be a base for uh, ancient uh, Vedic cosmology. Vedic cosmology presented from the Vaishnava point of view and as based on the Vedas, we will find appreciation by real scientists because it has its own scientific basis. Science has always changed over the centuries. One theory after the other has come and replaced the former theory. And what is prevalent, everyone has accepted. But Vedanta doesn't change. Do you say that uh, these modern scientists have found out everything in this universe? They have not uh, explored all the possibilities in the field of cosmology. Only they have explored to some extent. They have seen through this Nalika Yantra or the uh, uh, telescopes and microscopes, etc., which are having their own limitations. And people uh, getting the information through limited devices, can they say they know everything? I don't agree with this particular point at all. Kepler put sun at a distance of 30 million miles from uh, Earth. But the modern scientists placed the same Earth at a distance of 93 million miles. In 1930, Pluto came into existence. 2006, it vanished. To realize the vision of the Vedic planetarium, Srila Prabhupada wanted a diagram depicting the structure of the universe. To this end, he engaged devotees and artists in drawing maps according to Srimad Bhagavatam. Those three, and I was doing maps, we had some big pieces of paper, and then after this, I was there for discussions, and uh, I would take some notes, and then try to make these maps. They were present sometimes while I was making the maps, other times I would make the maps on my own. And I really, I only think there were about three or four maps in Bumangala. But, uh, so I made this one big, big map. One of the maps was the concentric overview of Bumangala. Simultaneously, Srila Prabhupada sent out leading students to find a competent Vedic astronomer. After extensive searching throughout India, finally on April 30th, 1977, a reputed South Indian pundit was brought to Bombay, India to meet Srila Prabhupada. And the big canto, the description, of the planetary system. Yes. So we want the diagram. Yes. So kindly help us. This planetary system is hanging. Yes. Urdha Mula Dosaka. Same thing is explained in the Simad Bhagavatam. Yes. But how it is hanging and where it defines the situation of the planets and Plato's and Kings. Uh, so 
از پرش که بپرستان سر پایلی میگه درد سونا دو سلیم 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 And during that summer of 77, Prabhupada had a lot of meetings with him and Tamal Krishna Maharaj uh, to discuss how to do this Vedic planetarium. And they actually sent people out, they tried to get people from South India. There was a lot of effort that was made, you know, to try to get a good concept of how to present it. But they couldn't find anybody who was able to do it at least not to Prabhupada's satisfaction. So it was one of the things that Prabhupada left with us. Srila Prabhupada's desire for the diagram was not to go unfulfilled. That elusive map was discovered by Srila Prabhupada's disciples at the holy village of Melukote, some 50 kilometers north of Mysore, Karnataka in India. This diagram accurately depicted the entire cosmology of Srimad Bhagavatam in an ingenious yet simple rendering. The person through whom it was revealed to the world was the 19th century scholar saint Tiruvenkata Ramanuja G.R. Swami. Born in Sri Purumbudur, Tamil Nadu, Tiruvenkata Swami went on to become an Acharya or spiritual leader in the preceptorial line known as the Sri Sampradaya. He spent several years of his life in Melakote, which 900 years earlier had been the residence place of Sripad Ramanuja Acharya, the most prominent Acharya of the Sri Sampradaya. At Melakote, in the thousand-year-old temple, Tiruvenkata Swami studied and taught the Vedas and also worshipped the deity of Tiru Cheluva Narayan. One day, while studying the Mahabharat, a 5,000-year-old epic of ancient India, he came across some intriguing verses. In the fifth chapter of Jambukanda, Bhishma Parva of Mahabharat, it is said, Sudarshanam pravakshami dvipastu guru nandana Parimandalo Maharaja Dvipoyam Chakra Samstita Yatohi Purusha Pashe Tarshanam Mukamatmana Evam Sudarshana Dvipo Drishate Chandra Mandale Dviram She Pipalas Tatra Dviram She Chasaso Maha Sarvo Shadi Samavayes Sarvatapparivarita this Bharat Khanda is called Sudarshana Dvip since it looks beautiful to the eyes of the onlookers. Being circular, it looks like the disk of the Lord and it is attached to cyclic time in the form of a disk presided over by Lord Sudarshana. Bharat Khanda is in the form of a globe since all of its four corners are rounded like the bale fruit. When viewed from the moon, half of Bharat Khanda appears like the rabbit and a small people leaf, while the other half appears in the form of a big people leaf, with all of them surrounded by varieties of vegetation. Pondering the verses, he became perplexed. What on earth can a rabbit and people leaves have to do with geography or cosmography? As he sought to understand their meaning, he contemplated, meditated, and prayed.
Finally, by divine inspiration, he sketched a drawing of the rabbit and the people leaves, but still remained mystified about their connection with the Earth's geography. Suddenly it dawned on him that if the drawing was turned upside down, the rabbit perfectly corresponded with Europe, Asia, and Africa, while the people leaves corresponded with North America, South America, and Australia. These continents comprise our Earth, which the Mahabharat calls Bharat Kanda. Vishnu Purana also describes the Earth as Bharat Kanda and gives its diameter as 8,000 miles. The Earth is also referred to by the name Bharat Kanda in the invocation Sankalpa Mantra chanted by Brahmana priests since time immemorial up until the present day. Vedic cosmology gives descriptions of the entire cosmos including its subtle features. Perception and access to these subtle features, however, requires karmic qualification. Consequently, much of the cosmos described earlier, as well as parts of the cosmography about to be described, are imperceptible and inaccessible to us earthly inhabitants. Bharat Kanda is one of the nine islands of the larger and originally bow-shaped Bharat Varsha, which was divided by the sons of Sagara. Being completely surrounded by water, the islands are mutually unreachable. In the Vedas, Bharat Kanda, our Earth, is also referred to by other names such as Sudarshan Dvip, Kumarika Dvip, and Navadvip, etc. The famous mountains known as the Himalayas are tall and immovable. Here we find an abode of Lord Shiva, the greatest of the demigods. In the center of Jambu Dvip stands the most extraordinary divine golden mountain called Meru. Meru is shaped like an inverted cone and it is the sporting place for the demigods. Around Meru are many supporting mountains called Kesara. Jambu Dvipa is 0.8 million miles in diameter and is surrounded by the saltwater ocean of the same width. On top of Mount Meru is a resort of Brahma called Manovati. The famous celestial river Ganges descends to the center of Manovati and then flows out into four directions. Surrounding Manovati in the eight directions are the resort cities of the chief demigods. One of these cities is Amaravati the resort of Indra, king of heaven. King Indra lives here in majestic opulence attended to by musicians, dancers, and reciters. This is what you call as Brahma Sarana, the place of the palace. Knowledge of Meru and the cosmography of the greater earth has been preserved and taught carefully by learned scholars in the preceptorial line known as the Madhva Sampradaya. The greater earthly planetary system extends out to the edges of the universe and has a diameter of four billion miles. Known as Bhumandala, shaped like a lotus flower, it has seven concentric islands and oceans with Mount 